I'll show you why this is the best written romance in light novel history. <laughs> Let's get it. We start in Kay's room and she's cozy. Not because it's a day off, but because she's no longer chained to her past. Kay remembered how she hit rock bottom. Betrayal at the hands of Aina Koji. But those same hands saved her. Kay thought to herself, was it her fault? She acted tough annoying, bound to attract bullies like Manabe. Thankfully, it's all over. But there's another problem. No matter what she does, she can't get Ainokoji out of her head. Man's living there rent-free. Kei clutched her face red, embarrassed. Just the mere thought of Ainokoji got her all hot and bothered. When they first met, he was nobody. But Kei now knows the real him. Smart, mature, he'll never lose in a fight. And even if he's cold, calculating, he'll always save her. Kei didn't hate romance, she wants true love. But Aina Koji? She can't accept falling for him. He did terrible things to her. He should thank her for not holding a grudge. Kei forgave him when a normal person wouldn't. In fact, Kei wondered if she should go bother him. Pretend to be angry, you know, just for fun. While scheming, she received a text from Sato. They had a meeting. Kei surprised herself. Even after all that, she's fit as a fiddle. While changing, Kei noticed her scar. Before, it made her want to puke. But now she didn't mind it. So much change changed in just a day. However, she could never show this to a dude. They'd be repulsed. But Ainakoji saw it and he didn't mind. Thinking back, Kei had a major realization. He touched her all over. And you know her boy felt those thighs. Kei hasn't even held a boy's hand and he did all that? And once again, Ainakoji is all up in her head. Kei shook violently, no more thinking about Ainakoji. She met up with Sato and girl looked good. Sato had her hair done and everything, practically oozing good vibes. Kei had a sinking feeling what this was about. They sat down and Sato told her to order anything, her treat. And what is this about? Well, Sato had a date. Kei's like, oh, a date, huh? Sato blushed and nodded, so adorable. Kei asked with who, pray tell, is this date? Obviously, it was Aina Koji. Kei felt her ears ring with anger. Of course, she knew Sato was in love with Aina Koji. It was obvious as early as volume 6. But she played it cool, going, hey, so Sato's going for Aina Koji, huh? What is her? Surprise! Sato bragged about Aine Koji non-stop. Kei cut secondhand embarrassment. Kei tested Sato's feelings by pointing out better dudes to go for, but Sato turned them all down. Kei wondered if Sato realized Aine Koji's potential. If it's looks, Aine Koji is undeniably a stud. He ranks number 5 for hotness. If he gets serious with his talents, he'll beat out Hirata. And if Sato's dating him, she'll gain popularity. Aine Koji got attention after the relay, but it wasn't a lot. How did he get on Sato's radar. She fell in love with him just because he's fast? Kei thought that was so shallow. She knew way more about Aina Koji, about his dark nature. But Kei immediately stopped herself. She's here to support Sato, not talk crap about her. For the record, I agree with Kei. Sato's reasons are shallow. Why do I think she went after Aina Koji? Simple. He's hot. That's it. She keeps saying it's because he ran fast in the relay. But Sudo was undeniably the better athlete. Why didn't she fall for him? They both hang out with the idiot trio. They're both close to Horikita. Aina Koji's more mature, I guess, but she didn't even have enough interactions with him to know that. So after the race, Sato realized how good looking Aina Koji is and was like, yep, that's mine. Listen, not saying Sato's feelings are invalid, just pointing out the reasons aren't deep. Kei confirmed one last time if Sato is dead set on Aina Koji. Without hesitation, Sato nodded. Kei could tell she's serious. Kei kept up her act, congratulating Sato for finding someone she liked. And Aina Koji should be free. Sato agreed she wants to claim him first. But on the inside, Kei's blood is boiling. Despite the rooftop incident, despite the fact he told her he doesn't even like Sato, he still accepted the date. Kei took out her anger on some poor straws, ripping them to shreds. And the reason Sato invited Kei? She wants the secrets behind a successful date. It made sense. Kei and Hirata were Class D's only couple. Sato grabbed Kei's hand, begging for advice. This is a problem. Kei's relationship is fake. She has no idea idea what she's doing. Sure, they went on pretend dates, but her heart was never in it. If this was the old case, she'd fake being confident and act like she knew everything. But right now, she didn't want to. She wants to be real with Sato. However, that was not an option. She had to keep up the fake couple act. Or did she? Does she really need Hirata? Aina Koji got rid of her enemies and will always save her. Sure, the title of Hirata's girlfriend has its perks, but if she lets Hirata go, she's free to find real love. Kei asked if the date was to get into a relationship with Aina Koji. Sato's like, yep. Kei wondered how that would even work. 
Hanekoji isn't exactly normal. Is he even interested in romance? Sato shared her game plan. Lunch, movies, shopping, confession. Kei's like, wait, confession? Sato was all in. Kei's like, hold up. Give it like two to three days to see if you click. Kei asked why she fell for Ainekoji. Kei was still playing dumb. She can't let Sato know about their bond. Sato listed a bunch of reasons. He's cool, mature, fast, and other than Hirata, he's the only other dateable guy. Kei had to agree. Sato did want Kei to keep this date a secret. She doesn't want competition. And it's okay to tell Kei because she's taken. Kei didn't mind Sato relying on her. She kind of liked it. But why is it Ainekoji? If he was anyone else, Kei could fully support her. Kei instinctively let out a sigh and Sato noticed. Sato felt like she was bothering Kei. Oh girl, you don't even know that half of it. Kei panicked and told her not to worry. Kei had to suppress her feelings to help Sato. Kei asked when the date was and Sato answered on Christmas. Kei's mouth went wide. She almost stood up. Sato went hee hee hee. Kei's like, don't hee hee me. That day is for lovers. I Nikoji wanted to do naughty things with Sato. That idea crossed Kei's mind. So that's how it is, huh? But Kei caught herself. Nope, nope, you can't think about it. What they do is none of her business. Kei helped Sato improve her plan and they head back. On the way, Sato shared another secret. This is her first date ever. Which was surprising, Sato's a trendy gal. Kei comforted her. It just means she hasn't found someone she likes. Sato was happy Kei understood. But this led to another problem. Sato wants a double date. Kei and Hirata with her and Ainekoji. She wanted Kei's help on the actual date. In her mind, Kei's like, no way. She has no experience it'll be painfully obvious. Sato sensed Kei's hesitation and made sense. Kei would want to spend Christmas alone with her boyfriend. This made Kei realize that as long as she and Hirata keep up this act, neither will find true love. What's more, as long as Kei is Hirata's fake girlfriend, Ainekoji will never see her as a potential love interest. And again, she's back to thinking about her boy. This isn't good for her heart. So Kei planned to kill two birds with one stone. She'll just help Ainekoji and Sato get together. That way she'll be forced forced to give up on Ainekoji, so she promised to help Sato with the double date. Sato was over the moon. Kei knew Sato liked Ainekoji, and she sincerely asked for Kei's help. But here's a question, why should Kei go so far for Sato? She has no obligation to, doubly so given Kei's complicated feelings. Well, it's because she wants to. On the inside, Kei is a kind person, and is very similar to Ainekoji in this sense. She likes to help people. This is the author giving us a taste of Kei's real personality. We get to see the payoff of the growth from volume 7. What Kei is like without the parasitic persona. And Kei's next monologue supports that. Kei mentions in the past she's never genuinely approached relationships. It's always been her being bossy, mean, putting on a front. She's tired of it. She wants to make real friends. And it all starts with helping Sato. But that's getting harder by the second because Sato wants the double date to seem coincidental. Bad idea. No way they fool Ainekoji. But Kei can't just say that. She needs to play dumb. And Sato was married to that plan, so Kei will do her best. Let's see if they can really deceive Ainekoji. Back in her room, Kei's emotions came flooding in. Sato was in love with Ainekoji. Kei would help them get together. It's a lot to take in. What was Ainekoji thinking? Is he actually interested in Sato as a girl? Or is he looking to just use her? Just like when he approached Kei, she wondered if he'd abandon her for Sato. If their relationship would no longer exist, would he still protect her? Kei typed out Ainekoji's number but could not not make the call. What would she even ask? Did you really think Sato is easier to use than me? Is that what she'd say? It's almost like she wants to be used. Kei repeated to herself, it's only because she wants protection. That has to be it. There's no other reason. Kei stared at her phone, but no matter what, she couldn't press call. However, as fate would have it, Ainekoji suddenly called her. For a second, Kei's mind ran wild. Maybe he's worried about her. Maybe he's calling to check up on her. Her heart danced with joy, but with Within a second, he crushed all her delusions. Ainekoji wants her to investigate something. Kei was furious. She reminded him he severed their relationship and said he'd no longer rely on her. Throw back to the phone call where Ainekoji cut her off. In her head, Ainekoji should be asking if she's okay or apologizing for what he's done. But to think the first words out of his mouth were asking for a favor? Unbelievable. However, Ainekoji did not utter a single word. There's so many things Kei wanted to say. She she wanted to ask if he really understood his situation. There's no need for her to cooperate. In fact, he should protect her forever for free. But Kay didn't say any of that. She couldn't because deep down she was afraid that if she said anything more, he would leave her.
save her. K swallowed her pride and asked what he wanted. He wants her to investigate Sato. K wondered just how far the world would go to piss her off. K was like, fine, but asked why. Ainekoji completely ignored K's question, told her to send the details over to his mail, and then ended the call. K was speechless. The hell is wrong with him? K gathered the info and sent it over. She had no idea what Ainekoji was after and it killed her. No surprise there, this is K's major conflict in this volume. On the one hand, she's finally free to be her true self, but that comes at the cost of putting away her very real feelings for Ainekoji. But what happened from our boy's point of view? Let's rewind the clock back to morning. Ainekoji was at the pharmacy to buy some cold medicine. This will be relevant later. Everything's going smoothly until Arisu approached him. She wants to quote unquote play. Ainekoji turned her down. Arisu is an attention magnet and our boy's allergic. However, he couldn't shake her off. The lolly is determined. She questioned him about Ruin. He was so obsessed with finding X just a few days ago. Why did he suddenly just stop? What is up with that? Ainekoji did not say a word. Arisu continued. She knew about Class C. The fact that Ruin was overthrown. This is the fake story that Ainekoji and Ruin agreed to spread in Volume 7. Ainekoji lied saying he's aware but doesn't know the details. Arisu asked if Ainekoji was involved because it makes no sense. Ainekoji played dumb, saying even he's surprised that Class C crumbled. Ainekoji noticed Arisu analyzing him. Head to toe, she watched his every mood. Unfortunately, in no universe would she ever read him. And yup, Arisu got nothing. However, it was Ainekoji's turn. He questioned Arisu and Ichinose's relationship. Quite friendly now, aren't we? Arisu made it clear they're not friends. She got bored, so Class B is entertaining her. She asked if Ainekoji would be her opponent. Our boy's like, nope, Go play with Horikita. Horikita isn't a suitable opponent, Arisu replied. Then go to Ruin, the seniors, anyone but him. Impossible. Arisu's heart is set on Ainekoji. Our boy asks, what if he ignored her? Well, Arisu would just keep herself occupied with class B for now. There is a chance Arisu is bluffing. So why not turn that bluff into reality? Ainekoji provoked her, wondering if she could even beat Ichinose. Arisu asked what he meant. Ainekoji laid out facts class B is doing well, while class A is stagnating at best. Ainekoji doubts Arisu's capabilities. Our boy could see it. His words got to her. Time to go all in. Ainekoji revealed he knew she's the chairman's daughter. Arisu snapped, that is not public knowledge. Arisu probably got into class A because of her dad. Good old nepotism. He doubts she's the real deal. Arisu countered, pointing out that she's leading class A. How does he explain that? It doesn't matter. Ruin and Ichinose are doing the same. Hell, even Hirata pulled that off. And if we're talking about unity, Hirata is much better at it than Arisu. Commanding class A proves nothing. Just then, you hear a loud clack. Arisu pounds the ground with her cane. She apologized, guess her little tricks won't work on Ainekoji. But she cautioned him. He's getting all cocky because he's the white room's first success. Ainekoji saw where she's coming from. He had to be a success. Otherwise, his dad wouldn't obsess over him. Arisu believed being in the white room is nothing special. Sure, Ainekoji's better than the average student. But the white room is for rejects, the untalented. A natural genius would never need the white room. Ainekoji agreed that's exactly what his dad is after. The white room trained children from birth in an ideal environment. Sculpting talents who would lead Japan. The ultimate gamble to prove nurture can beat nature. But Ainekoji wondered why Arisu is so hostile. She was honest. If she can beat Ainekoji, she'll prove that no amount of effort will beat out natural talent. You can't overcome that gap. And just then Masumi arrived. She completely ignored Ainekoji and addressed Arisu. Remember, they had a secret confrontation in volume 6. They're not supposed to know each other. Arisu switched topics, asking their thoughts on Ichinose. Both had the same opinion. She's a saint. So what would it take to bring down a saint? Arisu questioned. Masumi had no answer. Class B's unity is unmatched. Arisu begged to differ. Everyone has a weakness. And even a saint has an ugly side. Arisu gave the final clue. Masumi is quite similar to Ichinose. At first, Masumi didn't get it. But then it hit her like a truck. She couldn't believe it. Looks like Arisu learned something interesting in their conversations. Arisu informed Ainekoji that she'll crush Ichinose shortly. That should prove her abilities. Guess his taunts work, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. His plan was set in motion long before. Ichinose first got on Arisu's radar because of Ainekoji. Remember that letter he spread back in volume 6? Where he told everyone that Ichinose is hoarding points. That's the trigger that made Arisu 
go after Ichinose. It's no coincidence that she approached Ichinose at the end of that volume. Arisu satisfied left with Masumi. Also, Arisu realized there was something between Ainikoji and Masumi. For now, she let it slide. Ainikoji was curious about Ichinose's secret. Well, it'll become obvious when she falls from grace. On the way back, Ainikoji noticed K and Sato. This was the meeting where Sato asked for K's help. Ainikoji noticed K isn't sick, so he decided to catch a movie. Movies became his favorite pastime. What wasn't his favorite was being the only single person in a theater full of normie couples. It's Christmas, so guess that's unavoidable. As the movie starts, a lone figure plopped down beside him. What's this? Someone else who's alone? Has Ainikoji finally found a comrade? He looked over to check out this brave girl. And to his surprise, it was Ibuki. Oh dear. The rooftop event happened yesterday. This is awkward. Thankfully, Ibuki hadn't noticed him yet. If he leaves right after the movie, he can avoid the headache. But soon, Ainikoji would be entrenched in an intense battle. The battle for the armrest. If you've ever been to a theater, you know this isn't a joke. There are no rules when it comes to the armrest. Anything goes. It can be the difference between a blissful movie experience or a very uncomfortable time. And Ainikoji is surrounded by enemies on all sides. To his right, a happy couple. The envy of everyone during the holidays. They got here early and captured the armrest to the right. Now, it was between Ainikoji and Ibuki. But before he could act, Ibuki captured the armrest. Utter defeat. And it gets worse. Ibuki noticed our boy and made a sound I can only describe as geh. Also, can we take a moment to just appreciate Akichi 9's coloring? And Ibuki's outfit, dude, every single time in these 0.5 volumes, she just looks so good. But how did Ibuki get here? Earlier this morning, Ibuki was annoyed. She just received news that Ruin wouldn't be dropping out. She knew Ainikoji did something. The very thought of Ainikoji ate her up. She needs a distraction and a movie is perfect. But she ran into the one person she did not want to see. Ainikoji tried small talk, but she ignored his existence. Fine by him, he can enjoy the movie in peace, is what he'd like to say. But Ibuki kept looking at him. Ibuki recalled the time they were stuck in an elevator. All along, Ainikoji was manipulating her, looking down on her. The very thought made Ibuki's blood boil. Meanwhile, Ainikoji just wanted to enjoy the damn movie. Our boy vowed to get out as soon as it's over. But Lady Luck had other intentions. Just before the climax, the screen went blank. Technical difficulties. Now, the two were stuck staring staring at a blank screen. Again, Ainikoji tried to break the ice, but all he got from Ibuki were snarky comments. However, Ibuki soon exploded, claiming Ainikoji was making fun of her. Our boy understood where she's coming from, but she has no right to hold a grudge. Ainikoji gave it to her straight. If she had power, none of this would be a problem. She could have helped Ruin. And if you remember the short story at the end of volume 7, this is how Ibuki felt. She had no room to argue. Ainikoji explained he has no intention of raising his class. He fought Ruin because he needed to. He's never looked down on anyone, not even once. Still, Ibuki could not accept it. Ainikoji says he has no interest, but he caused all these events. Ainikoji didn't give her a response. He's free to use his abilities however he likes. Frustrated, Ibuki turned her attention to the blank screen. She felt trapped within this theater, but she won't leave first because if she did, it would make it look like she's running away. Minutes go by and Ibuki lets out sigh after sigh. Ainikoji tried talking to her, but she stonewalled him. After 20 minutes of agonizing silence, Ibuki finally asked Ainikoji why he hasn't left yet. Ainikoji wants to see the ending, and he wants to judge it for himself, not read a review online. Ibuki did not care, she just wants him to leave first. Ainikoji knew this is a contest she will not win. He's a loner with zero plans, he can do this all day. Ultimately, there were no winners, they cancelled the screening. As they both left, Ibuki chased him down. She still couldn't forgive him. Ainikoji asked if she'd reveal his secret, reminding her that he can bring everyone down, including Manabe and her friends. Ibuki won't tell anyone, but she can't leave things like this. Ainikoji wanted a peaceful resolution, but nothing came to mind. After some back and forth, the two decide to part ways. But as Ainikoji left, he felt someone pulling on his arm. It was Ibuki and he was like, Oi, what are you doing? Apparently, Ishizaki was coming their way, so the two of them were forced to hide. They overheard Ishizaki's conversation. Ishizaki was 
hard at work spreading the fake story about Ruin's downfall. Ainekoji knew Ishizaki respected Ruin. While they lay in wait, Ibuki just randomly kicks Ainekoji's leg, asking, can't you dodge that? Ainekoji calmly informed her that he wasn't a psychic. However, soon Ibuki launched another kick, a roundhouse straight to his face. Obviously, Ainekoji dodged it. Ibuki's like, see, you can dodge. Well, yes, she aimed for his face with all her might. Ibuki asked why he kept his strength hidden. Ainekoji asked if Ibuki went around showing off her strength to everyone. Ibuki didn't have a rebuttal. And you know what Ibuki does when logic is not an option. She asked Ainekoji to fight her. Ainekoji's like, huh? Ibuki wants him to go all out. She won't drop it. Guess our boy had no choice. They looked for a suitable location, stumbling upon a storage room. And Ibuki's like, perfect. A staff member was inside, but soon they left. Ainekoji knew this was a bad idea, but Ibuki's heart was set. And sure enough, after a few minutes, the staff member locked the door. Deja vu stuck with Ibuki once again. At least this time it's not a blazing elevator. Just a freezing storage room. Much better. But they would fight here. Ibuki asked Ainekoji what rule he wants. Until someone surrenders or until someone goes unconscious. Ainekoji went with the surrender option. Ibuki's like, wait a minute. She knew Ainekoji planned to surrender immediately. You got me. Ibuki decided they'll fight until there's a winner. Ainekoji's like, fine, but he had his own condition. After this, Ibuki is not allowed to challenge him ever again. Ibuki didn't mind. She planned to end this here and now. Ainekoji knew it'd be over quick. His concern was getting out after. Ibuki was mad, realizing Ainekoji wasn't taking this seriously. She came at him with a flurry of kicks. Ainekoji knew knocking out Ibuki wouldn't be enough. He needs to break her spirit. How troublesome. While thinking, Ainekoji effortlessly dodged all her attacks. Even in that cramped room, Ainekoji used the palm of his weaker left hand to smack her forehead. The shock spread through Ibuki's entire body. This move is engineered to cause panic. And Ibuki went flying. If he had used any more force, it would have been lights out. But Ibuki still yelled out, why aren't you being serious? Even though Ainekoji's attack was clearly successful, Ibuki grabbed her head. Her vision went blurry. Didn't stop her though she approached at full throttle, putting all her strength into one kick. Ainekoji knew that kick would never land. He stopped it with one hand and choked Ibuki with the other, slowly draining the life out of her. Ibuki struggled to escape, even digging in with her nails. But Ainekoji didn't move an inch. He urged her to make a decision. Will she stop or keep going? If she continues, she can kiss her future goodbye. Ainekoji reminded her Ruin gave it everything he had. Can she do the same? Ibuki shot him a glare, but her body was honest. Her hands trembled. Finally at her limit, Ibuki tapped three times and Ainekoji let her go. Ibuki regaining her composure started complaining. She didn't think he'd go easy, but damn, he showed her no mercy. Ainekoji explained, she's not an opponent he can go easy on. Well, truthfully, he did go easy on her, but the goal was to make it look like he didn't. Ibuki admitted defeat, asking how Ainekoji got this strong. She's never seen anything like it in her life. Ainekoji gave her the obvious answer, practice. As a fellow martial artist, she should understand. But what now? They're stuck in a storage room. How the hell do they get out? Our boy had a solution, but it required Ibuki's cooperation. Ibuki was down. Ainekoji remembered the clerk's name, the same one who locked them inside. He called the store asking for that particular clerk. Once on the phone, Ainekoji explained the situation. The staff member opened the door straight away questioning them. Ainekoji put on an act, claiming he and his quote on code date, Ibuki got a little bit too excited and wandered into this place. Ainekoji knew the idiotic couple act would work really well since it's the holidays. He even used Ibuki's first name, Mio, urging her to also apologize. Ibuki's like, huh? She had no idea what was going on. However, Ainekoji using his intense gaze was able to shut her up. Ibuki finally got it and played along. And after some back and forth, the clerk let them go with zero penalties. There's a reason Ainekoji called the specific staff member. It's partly his fault. He wasn't paying attention and let them sneak in. So it's in his best interest if this never happened. Walking back, Ibuki vowed to never get involved with Ainekoji again. Music to his ears. But she did have one last question. She wanted Ainekoji's opinion. Is it possible to save 800 million private points? Remember, this is Ruin's plan for class C. Ainekoji's immediate answer? Impossible. Ibuki agreed and they both parted ways for good. On the way back, 
fact, Ainekoji noticed three girls shopping. Shinohara, Sato, and Matsushita. Ainekoji hid himself so they wouldn't notice. The girls talked about love. And Sato let slip that she might have something to do with Ainekoji. So they grilled her to no end. But once the girls mentioned Ainekoji's name, he stopped listening in. And made his way to a nearby bookstore. Where he noticed an unusual student, Ruin. Guy got beat up yesterday and is acting like nothing happened. Ainekoji felt the bookstore didn't really suit Ruin. However, outside Ainekoji noticed another confrontation. Shinohara was alone and got into trouble with that couple. Ainekoji recognized the dude. He was the one that sold them test questions in volume 1. The guy did not look like he wanted a fight, but his girlfriend did. She demanded an apology from Shinohara for bumping into her. But Shinohara whispered it's the girlfriend's fault. And this sent the girlfriend to full on rage mode. Shinohara scared, apologized, but it wasn't working. However, soon came Shinohara's knight in shining armor, Ike. He figured what's up. He told the couple to not worry about it. Shinohara glares at everyone. It's nothing personal. Shinohara wasn't exactly happy hearing that, but understood Ike's actions. Ike knew the right play was to appeal to the dude, who wanted none of this. And after mentioning a nearby teacher, the couple dropped it. Shinohara complained about Ike's mean comments, but still thanked him. While Ike, embarrassed, decided to leave. Still teasing Shinohara, saying, enjoy Christmas without a boyfriend. Shinohara yelled at him as he left, but still longingly looked at Ike's back as he walked away. Damn man, that's so cute. Ainekoji came here to gather info on Sato, but guess that's not happening. So you can see why he reached out to K for that errand. On his way back, Ainekoji got a call from Haruka. The Ainekoji group planned a gathering on Christmas, but Ainekoji had plans, so he can't make it. Now, if Haruka had cat ears, they'd be pointing all the way up. Cause this is what she's been waiting for. She's like, what plans do you have? Hmm? Ainekoji was honest. He's hanging out with Sato. Haruka kept on teasing him. Ainekoji tried to play it off saying it's not a date, but come on, man. On a serious note, Haruka was worried about Sakura. She'll wonder what's up if Ainekoji doesn't show. And if she sees Ainekoji out with Sato, she might very well faint. With anyone else, that'd be an exaggeration. But with Sakura, Ainekoji couldn't really rule it out. Haruka realized Ainekoji actually understood Sakura's feelings. And here Ainekoji goes on a long monologue, showing us his exact exact feelings on Sakura. To him, she's like a baby bird, just taking her first steps. Obviously, she latched onto the first guy she was close to, which is him. He knew she needs experience because he's on the same boat. He still has no idea what friends are, what it means to love someone. He doesn't want to make a quick decision. In any case, Haruka understood and would cover for him, making sure they don't run into each other. Ainekoji apologized for ditching them. Haruka's like, don't worry, that's what this group is all about. You can come and go as you like. Ainekoji was thankful for that. The next morning, Ainekoji had a date, but it's not with Sato. Today, he had a date with a dude. Our boy sat on a deserted bench and his date joined him. It was Ruin, who was annoyed at being called out this early. But our boy couldn't risk being seen with him. Ruin demanded he spill the beans. What does he want? Ainekoji joked, what if he's here to just gossip? Ruin told him to stop. Ainekoji knew Ruin wouldn't buy it. He's not stupid. Ainekoji risked a lot to meet him like this. There's no way it's for nothing. Ainekoji complimented Ruin for being out and about after his loss. Dragon Boy's like, damn straight, he can do what he wants. Or does the mere sight of him give Ainekoji anxiety? Maybe he'll regret not expelling Ruin. Dragon Boy took a seat and Ainekoji got down to it. Ainekoji analyzed Ruin's loss, pointing out what I explained back in volume 7. He lost because his lackeys were there. Ruin did not appreciate the advice, saying he thought he liked to mess with people. But Ainekoji is giving him a run for his money. Now, Ainekoji's monologue here is huge. Notice this part. If I don't use Ruin, his existence will be nothing more than an impediment. Now, do you see anything wrong here? Yeah, what he's saying makes no sense. Ainekoji knows Ruin cares about about his underlings because Ruin wouldn't drop out if it meant Albert and Ishizaki also had to drop out. That's how he got Ruin to stay. Now, Ainekoji has dirt on Ruin's underlings, enough to get them either expelled or harshly punished. Would Ruin dare to challenge him under these conditions? Yeah, no way. Also, the entire school at this point knows Ruin is stepping back. Arisu knows Ishizaki is going on spreading the rumor. Ruin is alone by himself. Legit, nothing gives us a sign Ruin is going to be a problem. The reason Ainekoji 
Koji is doing any of this is to help Ruin. That's the first thing he did after Ruin gained consciousness. It's the first thing he talked about after they met up today. But Aine Koji doesn't understand that about himself. He doesn't know he likes to help people. And that help often takes the form of him wanting to see other people grow. So he makes excuses, reasons to rationalize his actions. I wanted to point this out because it's the first example in this volume. Him rationalizing things will play a bigger part later. And what Aine Koji says next supports his desire to watch Ruin grow. Aine Koji taunts Ruin asking if he's really that down after one loss. To Ruin nothing else matters. If he can't beat Aine Koji then what's the point? Our boy knew Ruin had potential, what a waste. Regardless, Aine Koji had something else to discuss. But Ruin wasn't hearing it, this whole conversation is a waste of time. Ruin moved to leave but Aine Koji stopped him. Our boy asks Ruin, aren't these battles boring? Class D beats Class C, then they beat Class B, and finally Class A. Does it really have to go down like that? Aine Koji offered Ruin free information. Soon Class A will attack Class B. The chance is 50%. Since Arisu could be lying to him, Aine Koji advised Ruin to attack class A while they're busy with class B. Ruin asks what about Ichinose? Don't they have an alliance? Arisu will 100% crush her. Aine Koji couldn't care less. In fact, it's convenient if Arisu takes them down. Even better if Arisu expels some of them. He'll finally get to see the penalties for expulsion. Ruin did not like this. Aine Koji has no ambition so why does he care? Simple, Aine Koji doesn't want to do anything. But if his surroundings magically lift him up to class A then it's not so bad. Ruin asks if he'll be observing. Nope, Aine Koji had other matters to attend to, namely Kushida. Ruin's like, oh yeah, she's a problem. Kushida reached out to Ruin back in volume 7, but he left her on red. Ruin knew if it was class D or Horikita, Kushida can end them both. But against Aine Koji, she's useless. Still, Kushida is a disease. If left alone, she'll kill everything around her. Well, Aine Koji knew how to deal with her. Get her expelled. Ruin was digging this conversation. Finally, some fun. He pointed out how scary Aine Koji is. Expelling Kushida will will hurt in the short term. But Aine Koji isn't afraid to lose the battle in order to win the war. Aine Koji offered Ruin the deal again. They can cooperate without being allies. Ruin's like, okay, the Kushida talk was fun, but attacking class A is a whole other ball game. Ruin still believes that Aine Koji is hell bent on manipulating him. Otherwise, none of Aine Koji's actions make sense. Aine Koji offered Ruin another piece of advice. The plan he has to save 800 million private points won't work. Ruin disagreed. Within the school, there are 480 students. The amount of points moved per year is massive. If you can tap into that, it's possible. Our boy's like, nope, he did the math. The most you can save over three years is 180 million. And in practice, it'll be even less. He can't see it. And it's his policy to disregard plans with a low success rate. In the middle of this heated discussion, Ruin noticed something odd. Aine Koji was being buried by snow? Ruin asked why. Aine Koji's like, the snow felt good, so why not? Is that weird? Ruin's just like, you crazy bastard. And snow aside, I can see why our boy's number 5 for hotness. He's killing it in the looks department. Back to the story, Aine Koji asked if Ruin would target class A. Dragon Boy is skeptical. Aine Koji could betray him at any second. How can Ruin trust him? Our boy's like, simple. Make sure you're smart enough not to be betrayed. Ruin should understand that. Ruin's like, fine, he'll lay the groundwork. Starting the new semester, Ruin is not leading. So he'll advise Kaneda and Hyori to attack class A. But in return, when when Aine Koji rises to class A, he'll owe Ruin a favor. Aine Koji asked if Ruin would pull the strings. Nope, Ruin will just tell class C to attack class A, that's all. Aine Koji felt like this was a scam. Owing him a favor just for that? Ruin's like, damn right, his cooperation does not come cheap. Aine Koji's like, fine, it's a deal. But there is something else. Listen, I lied to you. I said Aine Koji had a date with a man and that's clearly not the case. He had a date? with two men, and the second one showed up right then. It was Manabu. Ruin was shocked. Why is the former president here? Ruin noticed Aine Koji and Manabu were close, and he instantly made the connection to Horikita. Side note, Manabu completely chose to ignore the literal mountain of snow on top of Aine Koji's head. He is not touching that subject. Manabu assumed Ruin is an ally, and Dragon Ball is like, huh? Aine Koji guaranteed at the very least, he's not an enemy. Manabu got down to the matter at hand. Aine Koji promised to keep Nagu 
Kagumo in check. This was news to Ruin, but that's part of Ainakoji's plan to let Ruin know what's going on. Ainakoji explained Manabu doesn't like the way Nagumo operates. Ruin understood. Rumor has it all the second years are under Nagumo's control. So for Manabu, the only real option is a first year. Ruin asked Manabu when he started eyeing Ainakoji. Manabu was honest right after he enrolled. Dude ends up roasting Ruin, saying it took you some time, huh? Ruin laughed, saying he enjoyed the process. And Manabu just points out how that process got him beat real good. Ruin challenged Manabu, you wanna go here now? Manabu legit had zero interest. Ruin's like, thought so. But it didn't end there. Ruin kicked Snow right into Manabu's face, trying to blind him. And then within seconds, Dragon Boy launched a kick right at him. Blinded or not, Manabu effortlessly blocked the kick. Ruin offered Manabu a backhanded compliment, praising his skills, while Manabu reminded Ruin that he declined his challenge, and then turned to Ainakoji saying, you've got quite a reliable friend. Our boy had to agree. Ruin not getting the attention he wanted was like, whatever. The president and Ruin acknowledged each other. I just love the venom in every word between these two. The sarcasm is on another level. Regardless, Manabu laid out what he wants. For Ainakoji to quote-unquote maintain the order of the school. He can do it however. Get rid of Nagumo, hurt his influence, stop him from carrying out his plans. As long as Ainakoji prevents Nagumo's actions, it doesn't matter. Starting the new year, Nagumo will make his move. Ainakoji asked specifics, what can he do? Manabu explained the council holds considerable power. A great example is solving disputes. The real kicker is influencing special exams. Remember the island exam in volume 3? Yeah, the student council had their hands in that. So Nagumo could hit them with an exam they've never seen. However, Ruin did see Nagumo's point of view. He's just trying to make things interesting. Manabu agreed, but he's doing it wrong. Nagumo's actions have already led to 17 expulsions. And once he takes office, there will be many more. Ruin's like, so the weak deserve to be booted. Manabu did not agree. An ideal leader should aim to guide everyone to graduation without expulsions. Ruin didn't buy the goody two shoes act. Questioning Manabu, has he never expelled anyone? Manabu didn't even bother to respond to Ruin. Ruin turned to Ainakoji for his opinion. Our boy pointed out the obvious. Some people might not want others to be expelled, but Ruin and Ainakoji are not those people. In any case, Manabu didn't care as long as Ainakoji can stop Nagumo. At this point, Ruin was bored and decided to leave. Ainakoji asked if he'd continue to be alone. Ruin's like, yup, that was always his style. Manabu remarked that friends will be necessary. In that case, Ruin isn't a bad choice. But to take on Nagumo, Ainakoji needs information. Manabu had him covered. He gave him detailed profiles on all student council members. This intel is a godsend. But Ainakoji still needs intel on Nagumo. What type of person is he? What tactics does he use? Manabu revealed there is a second year who's willing to talk. But Manabu can't tell him anything. Because it could put that person in danger. But then why would Manabu even mention this? Ainakoji asked if Manabu's plan is to get them in contact. Yep, Manabu can give the second year Ainakoji's information. Introducing him as a first year who can take action. Our boy accepted the offer. This whole student council thing was a hassle. But Ainakoji reckoned he only needs to put up with it until graduation. He wondered if Manabu understood that. And yep, he did. Manabu did not care. It's fine if it's until graduation. If things don't change, then it is what it is. Ainakoji asked what if he fails against Nagumo. Manabu was confident Ainakoji is capable. He wouldn't choose someone incompetent for the job. Ainakoji asked Manabu about Horikita. Manabu told him to use her as he sees fit. Ainakoji asked if Manabu noticed Horikita's potential. Manabu wasn't convinced she had any potential. Ainakoji's like, sure, she's not perfect, but she's better than most. Nope, to Manabu, she's always chasing his shadow. Pay attention to this line. It's a major clue as to why Manabu is cold to her. After the meeting, Ainakoji went back to his room. He contacted Horikita and they decide to meet up at a cafe. On the way over, Ainakoji overheard the idiot trio and turns out Ike has a date with Shinohara on Christmas. Interesting. And the surprises don't stop there. Upon arrival, there was a surprising face. Horikita was hanging out with Kushida. And listen, I'm not the biggest Kushida fan on the planet, but I gotta admit, she looks so good here. Yo, someone whip out the crazy hot scale. We're gonna need it. Ainakoji asked who invited who. Horikita made the move. Horikita demanded our boy spill the beans. What does he want? Ainakoji's like, nah, we can talk later. There was no advantage to having Kushida hear this. But Kushida interjected, urging Ainakoji to join them. And Horikita backed her up. Ainakoji still refused and Horikita called him out, asking if this is something he doesn't want Kushida to hear. That's exactly right, but Ainakoji can't 
can't just say that. Horikita went on saying it's unnecessary to keep secrets. Ainakuji explained this is between him and Horikita. Oof, Horikita was adamant. She wants to hear it now. She pressured him. If it's not now, she's not gonna hear him later. Ainakuji figured Horikita is doing this to earn Kushida's trust, but he doesn't want Kushida to hear the details. So he changed his story, asking if Horikita wants to join the student council. Horikita was confused and Ainakoji clarified, Manabu wants her to join. Horikita didn't buy it, and she's right to think so. This was all made up, but Ainakoji knew Manabu would play along. So Ainakoji challenged Horikita to call Manabu and find out if he's bluffing. Using Kushida's connections, Horikita got Manabu's number, and sure enough, Manabu played along. But Horikita gave Ainakoji a dirty look, she won't be joining. Ainakoji's like, why? Horikita was sure this is not for her sake. This whole scenario is sus. Well, our boy did his best. No more intel for Kushida. He told Horikita to think it over and left. But as he did, he could feel Kushida scheming. This whole meeting will be important later on. That night, Ainakoji had a visitor, Sakura. Looking really cute, I must say. She came bearing gifts, a pair of gloves. Ainakoji tried them on and they were perfect. In fact, if he were to go out and buy gloves, he'd buy this exact pair. Sakura gave him an adorable smile, happy he liked the gift. She wanted to deliver it now since they won't be meeting tomorrow. Man, poor girl doesn't even know he has a date. But Ainakoji did vow to return her kindness with a gift of his own. And the next day was huge. Ainakoji had his first date ever. He wasn't sure how it would go or if something inside him would change. But he knew the day would be significant. Otherwise, he would have never accepted it. He was open to falling in love, to share the good and the bad, to hold someone so close that they become an irreplaceable existence. Ainakoji wondered if he'll ever feel that. Let's find out. Ainakoji arrived early, but Sato was already waiting. Girl adorably hopped over to greet him. Ainakoji wondered if Sato understood personal space because girl came in hot, but he did notice she smelled nice. Sato looked through her back because she forgot her phone. And Ainakoji caught a glimpse of a gift. And before the date could officially start, a couple interrupted them. It was Hirata and Kei. Wow, what a surprise. Come on, we all know this was set up. Today, Kei would play Cupid. She readied her arrow of love. One shot and Ainakoji will fall hopelessly for Sato. Hirata, on the other hand, had no idea any of this was planned. He was surprised to see Ainakoji and Sato together. And seeing Kei happily chat with Sato, that caught him off guard too. They're usually not that close. And when Ainakoji heard this alarm bell start ringing, he started doubting the authenticity of this meeting. Because remember, he saw Kei and Sato talking at the cafe. If they're not close, then why are they together? Either way, Hirata and Ainakoji did not want to interrupt each other. They moved to part ways. But out of nowhere, Kei starts teasing Ainakoji and Sato, asking how long they've been dating. Sato was obviously happy and playfully denied it. And Ainakoji backed her up. But Kei kept on teasing them. Even Hirata agreed they look like a couple. Time for Kei's master plan. She suggests the double date. Oh boy, here we go. Hirata was understandably confused and Ainakoji didn't know whose plan this was, but my god was it aggressive. Hirata was the first to object saying their plans might not align, but Kei countered saying doesn't that make things more exciting? When it came to the whole double date thing, Kei obviously took the lead, but Ainakoji couldn't think a single reason as to why, which meant it had to be for Sato. And sure enough, Sato was down. Down. Hirata hesitated, but would accept if everyone else did. So that means it's all up to our boy. Now this is rough. On the one hand, Ainakoji is a complete dating noob. He has enough trouble with a one-on-one -on -one date. A double date is out of the question. It's like trying to kill the last boss when you can't even damage slimes. But then again, being the only one to object? That's just too much social pressure. Well played. Kei created a scenario where Ainakoji can't refuse. And so the double date was a go. Immediately, Ainakoji noticed Sato relax. The story fell in place. Sato wanted this double date because she's nervous. And oh look, what a coincidence. They all had plans to watch the same movie. Dude, at this part, you can practically feel the sarcasm ooze from Ainakoji's monologue. Here's what he says next. I asked the two of them where their seats were going to be. Let's see whether coincidences continue to pile up or not. Unfortunately, that's where Lady Luck stopped smiling. Their seats were separate. Can't make things look too bait, am I right? The four of them walked towards 
towards the movies and Sato snuggled up close to Aina Koji. K again teased them saying how good they look and Sato was loving every second of it. And Aina Koji's like yeah I suppose. To our boy this was a no brainer. They're out during Christmas so of course they look like a couple. However on the other end K was frustrated. Here she is killing her own feelings trying to help them out. And the best Aina Koji can say is I suppose? What kind of answer is that? Shouldn't he be happy to be on this date? However K calmed herself Cupid must not think bad thoughts. K teased them a bit more but nothing. K noticed Sato glancing at Aina Koji, trying to figure out if he's enjoying this date. But this blockhead had no facial expression. It's like he doesn't even know he's on a date. K wondered if they came on too strong. So she left the conversation. Meanwhile, our boy is in deep thought. He noticed that Sato was happy when K teased her. Why? Does she find him attractive? Kind of how like a dude would find an idol attractive. If so, that's questionable. But now that K stopped harassing them, there is another problem. Our boy had no idea what to talk about. He did have a few canned lines from the internet, but he didn't want to use them, afraid that Sato will find out. And right now you might be going all this thinking. He hasn't talked for a while, huh? You are absolutely on the money. I don't think any two human beings have ever gone this long without saying something. At this point, Aina Koji and Kei could communicate with their eyes. And Kei's eyes asked him, is it painful being this quiet? And while Aina Koji's eyes shot back, I have no idea what I'm doing. Kei picked up her arrow of love and got to work. She straight up told Sato Aina Koji didn't know what to say. Girl was relieved finally realizing what the hell's going on. They talked about idols for a bit, but mid conversation Aina Koji made a grave mistake. He gave Sato a one word answer. It's like when you text someone and they respond with K. What the hell do you say to K? Nothing. That's a conversation ender. And Sato and Aina Koji were back to silence hell. But Sato threw our boy a lifeline, asking him about his taste in music. Aina Koji will not make the same mistake twice. But here's something interesting. When you read Aina Koji's monologue, you can see he's trying to come up with answers. If I honestly open up about my interests, what would happen? But if I pull out Beethoven or Mozart here, then it's definitely an out. The answer she's expecting would probably be a famous musician or idol group, basically a modern song. I need to answer with something towards Sato's expectant look. This sends me right back to volume one where he's faking his personality, always thinking about what a normal person would say rather than what he actually wants to say. Their conversation led to the sports festival, Sato practically gushing over Aine Koji's speed. But this is where the date gets weird. Kei interrupts their conversation saying Aine Koji isn't fast. Maybe him and Manabu were just slow so it looked like he was fast. But Hirata corrected her. No, no, he's fast. But out of nowhere, K starts badmouthing Aine Koji, calling him a weakling. Also that he seems like a really cold person, like he wouldn't check up on a loved one if they were sick. Now, if you have your trusty petty meter with you, that thing should be going crazy. Even Aine Koji understood K's salty because he didn't check up on her. So she delightfully bullied him, but she's also actively helping Sato. Thankfully for our boy, both Hirata and Sato defended him, saying he's a kind person. However, Sato was no longer smiling. It wasn't Kei's comments, she had something else on her mind. Sato asked Aine Koji if he had any questions for her. They talked about a few things like pets. Kei and Hirata even joined in. And the conversation was great until it wasn't. When it got to the topic of girls, Kei questioned Aine Koji's relationship with Horikita. The look on Sato's face screamed that she wanted to know too. So Aine Koji clarified she's just his neighbor. Aine Koji couldn't help but feel Kei was targeting him. Sure, Sato wanted the double date but Kei 100% came up with the game plan. And Kei did not buy Aina Koji's answer. She painted a scenario where Aina Koji was in love with Horikita but didn't have the balls to confess. Sato hearing this was struck with anxiety. She wondered if she's bothering Aina Koji by inviting him out. Our boy assured her he wants to be here but Kei's attacks were just beginning. She asked Aina Koji if Sato is his backup plan because he can't get Horikita. Yo that is cold. Aina Koji's like do you really think I'd do that? Kei answered yes in a heartbeat. Our boy was not amused. At first he thought Kei was here to help Sato, but now he's wondering if she's trying to sabotage him, cause this ain't helping. However, Sato stepped in defending Aina Koji, saying he wouldn't do that, thank god. But 
K continued, mentioning how close he is to Kushida. This time, Aina Koji was ready, saying Kushida is close to everyone. Kei's like, yeah, all the guys want to date Kushida. Subtly hinting that Aina Koji might harbor those same feelings. Aina Koji turned to Hirata for support, and Hirata backed him up, saying, yeah, she's popular. But Aina Koji doesn't like her like that. Finally, salvation. But just when our boy was out of trouble, things got much worse. Suddenly, from a group of seniors, somebody called out to Aina Koji. It was Nagumo. He wanted to talk. Two notable faces were with him. Nazuna, the girl whose pendant Aina Koji found back in volume 7. And Ichinose, who smiled at them but didn't dare step up. The fact that Ichinose didn't step up here is gonna be huge in the future. Sato was nervous and K on guard. Hirata reading the mood stepped in. He knew Nagumo from the soccer club, so he tried de-escalating. Hirata asked if Aina Koji did anything. Nagumo's like, nope, he just wants to talk. Aina Koji asked if they had business. Nagumo realized his group might be intimidating them, so he told them all to go on ahead. They were headed to karaoke and Nagumo asked if Aina Koji would join. Our boy's like, no thank you. And I kid you not, Nagumo literally says it was a joke and that bringing Aina Koji would ruin the mood, laughing at our boy in a condescending manner. And then we figure out the reason for this confrontation. Nagumo knows that Manabu acknowledged Aina Koji. Hirata spoke up asking if this is about the relay. Hirata covered for Aina Koji saying it was his idea to send our boy in. But it wasn't working, Nagumo forcefully gripped Aina Koji's arm. This sent everyone into panic mode, almost like a fight would start. However, K stepped in at the right time, interrupting Nagumo, commenting on how scary he looks. In a playful way, of course. This got rid of the tense atmosphere, and Nagumo apologized, but still held on to Aina Koji, looking him right in his eyes, claiming if Manabu saw something in our boy, then it 100% exists. You sure know a lot about Manabu, Aina Koji commented. Nagumo did and was sad to see Manabu graduate. He challenged Aina Koji to be his opponent next year. The situation was wasn't all bad. Aina Koji got some valuable intel. Nagumo seems to be a man who needs to show off how great he is. Aina Koji asked Nagumo how he plans to change the school. Nagumo joked around saying they'd have fun exams, so it's a certainty he plans to influence the special exams. With that, Nagumo let go of our boy and left. Hirata let out a sigh of relief and Sato burst out, claiming how awesome Aina Koji is because Senpai noticed him. But Kei didn't agree, saying Hirata's still better. They finally arrived at the theater. Aina Koji and Hirata found seats. While the girl used the washroom. Hirata thanked Aina Koji for helping K. Aina Koji wasn't sure what he's talking about. Hirata didn't know the details but knew Aina Koji did something. Now K can stand on her own. Aina Koji asked Hirata if he's interested in romance. Right now all Hirata cares about is having peace within class D. Hirata asked our boy if he's planning to date Sato. Aina Koji was frank. No. Hirata advised Aina Koji to give dating a shot. It might do him some good. Well, so far, Aina Koji never had a chance to date properly. Romance can't really happen within the white room. There's no specific rule against it, but the environment doesn't support it either. No holidays, no free time, constant surveillance. By the way, throughout this entire volume, you'll notice Aina Koji keeps asking Hirata about his thoughts on love. This is no coincidence. Aina Koji knows Hirata has demons within him. He knows Hirata has faced trauma. It's it's not the same trauma as Aina Koji's, but it's trauma nonetheless. So Aina Koji feels like he can relate to Hirata. That's why he wants Hirata's opinion on love. He feels they're similar. So Hirata's opinion holds weight. Aina Koji asks Hirata about Nagumo. To Hirata, Nagumo is a reliable senpai who thinks outside the box. He's innovative and gets results. But the dark side is he isn't afraid to sacrifice people to get those results. Aina Koji asks Hirata if he joined the student council. Nope, Hirata had no interest. What a shame. Other than Horikita, he's the only other viable candidate. Aina Koji just lost a useful card. And just then, the girl showed up. After the movies, they played the question game. K asked Aina Koji if he's ever dated anyone. Now, our boy does not want to admit he has zero experience, because it can come off as pathetic. So he tried to give a cop-out answer saying he doesn't have one right now. But K called him out right away. Okay, so your age equals the number of years without a girlfriend. Got it. Bruh, she's been calling him out all day. However, K and Sato seemed kinda happy Aina Koji hadn't dated someone before. Next was Sato's question, she asked what kind of hair Aina Koji liked on a girl. Now this is kinda obvious. Aina Koji said it didn't matter, as long as the hair suits the partner. I mean look, this is a pretty basic answer. And Kei called him out saying it was a basic answer. But then Hirata backed up Aina Koji so she couldn't really say anything more. And to be honest, so far Aina Koji thought this date was going horribly. But on the contrary, Sato seemed to be into him. It was Aina Koji's turn to ask a question. And he asked 
asked Hirata if he's aware how popular he is. And Kei just shot him a glare, reminding him that he should be asking Sato questions. Well, he didn't have to since they arrived at the cafe soon. The original reservation was for two, but Kei got it up to four. She was proud of that fact. But Ainakoji just looked at her, his eyes saying, you liar. Kei's eyes shot back, I don't want to hear it from a dating newbie. They talked about future plans and Sato mentions wanting to be a fashion designer. Ainakoji wanted to try his hand at university. Kei also mentions wanting to go to uni. Now, right here, I'm gonna screw with your mind. This scene seems harmless, but there's a fan theory Wicked showed me that makes it downright creepy. Okay, we've established Sato likes Ainakoji because he's hot, but there's another theory as to why she's going for Ainakoji, and it has nothing to do with him. Sato is going after him because she's imitating Kei. Have you noticed whenever Sato talks about dating Ainakoji, she compares him to Hirata a lot. Here's a quote from the first time they interact. I thought the best guy in class was, you know, Hirata. But since he's Kei's boyfriend, there's nothing I can do about that, right? She only ever mentions Hirata in the context of dating Kei. And in fact, she never compares Ainakuji to anyone else but Hirata. Even though there are other top tier guys in the school. And it comes up again in this volume, right after the Nagumo fiasco. I do think Hirata is amazing, but... But... But I don't think Ainakoji will lose to him. Why is it always Hirata and why does it always sound so competitive? Because Sato is jealous of Kei's success and she wants to make it her own. There's various examples of this. They're both gals. Sato even tries to bully other girls like Kei. Remember back in volume one, she entered the idiot trio's chat and tried to get them to bully Horikita. Another reason why Sato consulted Kei for advice. Who better to learn from than the person you want to be? Zaqueen underscore seven has an incredible post that goes into the details. The imitations run deep even in the anime. Mannerisms, tone of voice, gestures, the way they dress. Hell, look at their outfits in this volume. Really, look at it. Jacket, jacket. Skirt, skirt. Even the sweaters are similar. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And here's the kicker. Sato says she wants to be a fashion designer, but the theory is that answer was originally Kei's. Kei told Sato before she wants to be a fashion designer, and Sato stole her answer. And since Kei's on the date to help Sato, she's not gonna make her look bad. So Kei gives a basic answer like university. And Ainakoji even mentions how vague that is. It was still all vague. But each and every one seems to be thinking about their future. Which was weird because so far all of Kei's answers were descriptive. So why not this one? The theory was she's caught off guard and gave a generic answer. Man, the first time I figured all this out, it gave me legit goosebumps. There's just something so freaky about imitating someone so deep. Back to the story, there were now five hours into the day and Ainakoji had fun. But next time, he could do without the continual attacks on his character. The four decide to part ways so Ainakoji and Sato were alone. Sato suggested taking a detour, but she still looked uneasy and then let out the reason, claiming Ainakoji didn't have fun. Ainakoji's like, no such thing. Why would you think that? Simple, for the entire day, Sato did not see him smile. She wanted to see it just once, but nothing. Sato reveals something else that's been bugging her. It was the time she tried to get the idiot trio to bully Horikita. Everyone except for Ainakoji was down. Sato thought Ainakoji held that against her. Damn, poor girl was almost crying saying this. Ainakoji set the record straight. He didn't care. Barely even remembered it happened. He would not judge her for something stupid like that. But Sato still wasn't convinced because again, he did not laugh even once. Ainakoji was frank. He sucks at laughing. Still, Sato was down. She did not think the date went well. And she is onto something. Don't get it twisted. Ainakoji enjoyed himself. And Sato gave him more goodwill than he could have hoped for but he'd like her to give up on that goodwill. In all honesty, Ainakoji could have made the date go better. He could have put in more effort, push himself closer to Sato, but he intentionally didn't because he had no feelings for her. And we knew this was coming. Even before Ainakoji told Hirata he wasn't into Sato. Take a look at this line. It's from two days earlier, from when he was describing his feelings about Sakura. What is school? What are friends? And what exactly does it mean to love someone? All these things I don't understand very well. I cannot make an early decision. Ainakoji already hinted this was gonna be a no, but he went on the date to see if he was wrong. Maybe they are compatible. Remember how he got intel on Sato from K? Yeah, he used none of that intel. He wanted to give the date a real shot. However, as the date continued, it was obvious they weren't compatible. So he put in less and less effort because he doesn't want to lead her on. He doesn't want to make her like him more, but life is never that simple. You guys remember, right? Sato's game plan. What was the last thing on that list. Sato clutched onto the gift she prepared and presented it with all her might and asked Ainakoji to go out with her. 
a gust of wind graced them both. There it was, the first confession Ainekoji had ever received. It was special. Special enough to ignore the person spying on them right now. Ainekoji didn't prolong it. That would be cruel. He turned her down. He can't meet her expectations. Sato showed him a bitter smile. She asked him why. Does he have someone he likes? Ainekoji assured her it had nothing to do with her. He needs to sort out his own feelings first. And he felt going out with someone while not being in love with them? Well, that's just insulting. He explained he's never been in love before, not even once. So it's not about dumping her. He needs to first understand what love is. Sato wondered if she went too fast. Maybe she messed up. Now, this next monologue for me explains why Aine Koji feels they're not compatible. Read this. If Sato would be my partner, there should be no complaints. Even now, telling her I've changed my mind, please go out with me, is still the correct judgment. But even so, my mouth has been sealed shut and would no longer open. This type of talk is very similar to Volume 1, where he's playing a character. What a normal student should be like. In fact, reading through the entire date, it's riddled with monologues like these. Which tells me even now after the confession, Ainekoji can't be his true self around Sato. He can't drop the fake act. That's why he feels they're not compatible. Back to the story, Sato thanked Ainekoji for today. Ainekoji wasn't sure if Sato would continue to like him, or if she'd find somebody else. But one thing was for sure, Sato was the first girl to ever confess to him. And that's something he won't forget for the rest of his life. Now this is big and it tells us a lot about how Ainekoji sees romance. He's quite pure, believe it or not. And for good reason. Remember, he's only been out of the white room for 8 months. No romance in there. He's approaching love as a complete complete beginner. So any girl confessing to him is massive. Hell, any kindness is precious because he never had any in the white room. Forget that, even at the school, not a lot of people were nice to him. Horikita treated him to food in volume 1 only because she wanted his help. Sudo said he'd hang out with him in volume 4.5, but that was to only get to Horikita. And Yamauchi used him to get to Sakura in the same volume. That's why the birthday message he got from Kei was precious. It's the first time someone showed him genuine kindness with no strings attached. Yeah, Sakura gave him gloves in this volume. Yes, Sato confessed to him, but K was the first. And just like the confession, he'll never forget the first. Also, Ainekoji's newness to love is another way he's very similar to K. Both of them have little experience with the opposite gender. Sato asked if it's okay for them to play again. Ainekoji's like, of course, he really did have fun. Those were his honest feelings. But all of a sudden, Sato went silent. Ainekoji noticed large teardrops had built up in her eyes. The sadness she pent up for so long just burst out. She wiped away the tears saying she'd go on ahead as she ran off. Ainekoji walked in her direction until he could not see her anymore. Poor girl. Ainekoji felt if it was before the sports festival, he could have accepted her. Funny that it was during the same festival that she fell for him. Now, matter at hand, he received a call during the confession. An unknown caller and Ainekoji called them back. The person picked up but did not say a word. Our boy threatened to hang up and finally got a response. Can I trust you? Ainekoji told him to elaborate. The call was regarding Nagumo. It's the second year Manabu mentioned. From the voice, Ainekoji had an idea who this was. The person wants to talk face to face. So they set up a meeting in 20, which gave Ainekoji time to deal with the other matter at hand, the spy in the bushes. He called out to the person, but no response. He threatened to leave and that got the person talking. K emerged from the bushes asking how long he knew. From the beginning, Ainekoji added, K asked why he rejected Sato. Ainekoji was honest. He's not going to go out with someone he has no feelings for. By the way, that's also another reason he never considered going out with Sakura also shows us that Ainekoji does not like superficial relationships, just like K. Remember, K mentioned wanting genuine relationships when talking with Sato. K asked, Is it really okay to turn down a girl that's into him? Sato's a normal girl. She should have a normal relationship. That's something Ainekoji can't provide. K had to agree. But K felt there's a chance Sato could have accepted him, the real him. Newsflash, that's not true. K is hardcore projecting how she feels onto Sato. Remember how in volume 4.5, K and Ainekoji stopped the idiot trio? K starts thinking Ainekoji did all those bad things not because he wanted to, but because it was necessary. K understands that because she's done the same. Earlier volumes, K surrounds herself with mean girls. And when the mean girls are, you know, mean, K had to go with the flow. Because if K ever became the target of their bullying, her entire act would fall apart. A big example is in volume 3 when Ibuki stole K's underwear. K cries, which is strange. She's supposed to act tough. Having her 
her underwear stolen reawakened her trauma. It's a way her previous bullies would torment her. So Kay understands what it's like to have to do things you don't want to. Back to the story, Kay asks Ainikoji if she would regret it. When Sato eventually finds someone else she likes. Ainikoji told her to just leave it be. Kay asked why not just try dating her, kind of like a trial period. Ainikoji was honest, they just aren't compatible, that's that. Kay wasn't too sure, Ainikoji looked like he had a lot of fun. Well, it's not like Ainikoji never thought about going out with her. Kay went, see, aha. Ainikoji claimed if he dated her, he could have experienced a lot of things. Hey, horny Koji, let's go. Kay actually didn't get it. So Ainikoji explained it's the naughtiest thing a couple can do, which is holding hands. I'm just kidding. He's talking about doing it. It's definitely that. Kay finally got it and was like, huh? He date her for a scummy reason like that? Ainikoji asked if she's never thought about it. Kay panicked. This was unknown territory for her. Ainikoji egged her on. Why not dive into the unknown? Well, it's not like anyone would do. And Kay agreed. However, in that department, Ainikoji had no problems with Sato. Kay was like, fine, then why reject her? Girl was straight up yelling. Ainikoji told her to chill and Kay's like, I'm not angry. While, you know, being really angry. Ainikoji explained if he accepted Sato, then Kay wouldn't be here right now. And following the scene, you have two essential monologues. You're gonna want to remember these. In the first, Ainikoji gives us his reasoning behind rejecting Sato. If he chose Sato, it would get in the way of him using K. Let me make this clear. It's not about being with her. It's about making use of her in his schemes. He says if he chose Sato, then K would lose trust in him. He acknowledges how his actions in volume 7 solidified her trust. She'll never betray him. Also, if he chooses Sato, it'll hurt K's usefulness. K will overcompensate trying to prove herself. He goes on to say Sato would be a viable choice if she matched K's capabilities. But that's clearly not the case. The incident with Nagumo proved that. K acted while Sato was frozen. Ainikoji goes over all the enemies he has. His father, Arisu, Sai, and how because of them, K is now crucial to him. He can use K against all of them. He even acknowledges the chairman can be a threat. And he could even use K against him by having her be a honey trap. I'm just gonna let you Google what that is. K almost as if reading his mind. Asks her boy if he only sees people as tools. Ainikoji responds saying it's not his intention. Then K asks if he's ever been in love. Ainikoji responds up till now, never. And thinking about love, Ainikoji goes into the second monologue where he admits he's never had love awaken inside him. The white room eliminated any chance of that. He feels he can never experience a normal romance. And even though he physically left the white room, it's still a part of him. He's always thinking about how to protect himself. Even though he doesn't need to, he acknowledges the white room persona. The fact that as long as you win, nothing else matters. He feels it's a mindset he'll never be rid of. He's stuck with it until the day he dies. The two walk across the snowy school. Ainikoji walking in front, K a little behind. No one would know they're together. Ainikoji was surprised K recovered this fast. And from there, they got into the topic of bullying. K apparently lied to Hirata. She said she was bullied from elementary school when it was really just from middle school. Basically saying she'd been bullied for longer, just to make her story seem more sympathetic. But then K asked Anikoji, isn't he gonna apologize for the whole Manabe incident? Anikoji's like, oh yeah, completely forgot about that. Oh, K wasn't done yet. How about the whole I won't rely on you thing? Anikoji took back his words. He'd like to rely on her. And then he apologized for the Manabe incident. By the way, let me clear up something about Manabe and K. Manabe didn't go after K because she bullied Rika. Manabe went after her because she's jealous. Remember the scene where Manabe tried to take K's picture? And K just knocked Manabe's phone out of her hand. Manabe wasn't trying to take a picture. She was trying to record K admitting to bullying. Manabe would later use that recording to bully K. She never planned to forgive K even if she apologized. Here's a snippet from volume 4 that shows us this. It's the moment where the bullies cornered K on the staircase. Manabe says, she's really pissing me off. I was even thinking about forgiving her actions earlier if she apologized to Rika. Never mind, I'm not forgiving her now. And then Yamashita, one of Manabe's friends says, you weren't gonna forgive her anyway from the start right? The whole Rika thing was a front. They were just jealous of Kei's success. So they wanted to bring her down. Why? Because they're terrible people. That's it. Back to the story as part of his apology. He wanted Ainikoji to tell him about the whole Nagumo situation. Ainikoji explained the whole Horikita sibling and how because of Manabu, Ainikoji got Nagumo's interest. K asked if Manabu knew Ainikoji's real personality. Our boy's like, nope, K is the only one who knows. K said that didn't make her happy, but she didn't look exactly unhappy either. 
And he could you explain because of the rooftop, he owes Manabu. And to return the favor, he has to keep Nagumo in check. And K had no doubt he could do it too. And Koji told K he's meeting a second year regarding all of this. He asked if she wants to come. K was down. The two arrived at the meeting spot, but no one was there. But Aine Koji was confident the person would show. And yep, a single student approached them. It was Vice President Kiriyama. Aine Koji knew about him from the files Manabu sent. Kiriyama was wary of K, but Aine Koji introduced her as his trusted partner. K couldn't help but hide her happiness. They got down to business. Kiriyama did not see eye to eye with Nagumo. He only joined the student council because he admired Manabu. Kiriyama tried stopping Nagumo from becoming president, but failed. From the tone of the conversation, you could tell Kiriyama felt defeated, confirming that all the second years are under Nagumo. Nagumo pulled this off by promising class A to anyone who excelled. So gifted students were all for it. Hell, everyone was willing to ditch their class and climb to class A. What other option did you have? Ainikoji asked if that's the case, why is Kiriyama against him? Kiriyama confessed that he doesn't believe in Nagumo's promises. So that's why he's fighting. It's the only reason he stayed on the student council, to collect dirt on Nagumo. He believed in Manabu's ideals, to uphold the traditions of the school. Kiriyama warned after the third years graduate, Nagumo's focus will be on Aine Koji's grade. The next special exam will include everyone. Nagumo will use this exam to scout out threats. Unfortunately, Aine Koji is already on his radar. Aine Koji asked for details on the special exam, but Kiriyama refused to break the school's code, and he felt the best way to deal with Nagumo was to drag him out of office. That way, Nagumo can't fulfill his promise to the second year and would lose control over them. Ainikoji thought Nagumo's defenses were impressive. Also, could our boy trust Kiriyama? Dude is definitely looking out for himself. Ainikoji told Kiriyama he'd operate as he sees fit. Kiriyama understood he didn't have Ainikoji's trust and stated bluntly his reason for wanting Nagumo gone is because he didn't want to see his junior suffer. Ainikoji had a hard time believing that. Ainikoji said he'd cooperate but wouldn't go out of his way to provoke Nagumo. Kiriyama's like, fine, he'll supply Ainikoji with information. He can do with it as he likes. But Kiriyama warned him, if Ainikoji is useless, he'll stop. And if their cooperation is found out, there will be consequences. The implication being he'd take down Ainikoji with him. With the conversation done, Ainikoji and Kei head back. Kei got bad vibes from the entire situation. She asked Ainikoji about the whole partner talk. Ainikoji asked if she disliked it. Kei was like, well, if you're gonna go ahead and say it, there's not much else I can do. Ainikoji's like, well, should I take it back? He's like, no, but if he wants her to be his partner, he should have the right attitude. And what attitude is that? Ainikoji asked. Kei's like, oh, I don't know. Give me money? Ainikoji had one word. Oi. Kei was obviously joking, but she did ask if Horikata is okay with this. Wasn't she his partner? Ainikoji assured her she's nothing more than a neighbor. Kei is the only one he acknowledged. Since it can't be helped, Kei agreed to be his partner. Ainikoji asked if she's okay with this. She could become a target. Kei said that doesn't matter as long as Ainikoji wipes out all their enemies. Well, if it came down to smarts or strength, Ainikoji is confident. But when school rules are involved, anything can happen. Regardless, Ainikoji repeated his promise. He'll always save her. Kei asked if he really meant that, and Ainikoji nodded. Kei was in a good mood, asking Ainikoji how he was in middle school. One word, normal. Obviously, Kei didn't buy it. Kei had a theory. If this was a manga, then Ainikoji would be a secret agent, raised in a facility from childhood. Now, isn't that fascinating? She asked Ainikoji if that's the case. Ainikoji did not confirm a thing, saying it's a secret. Kei vowed one day she'll make him spill the beans. As they talked, it began to snow. For a bit, Kei went quiet. She asked if Sato gave him the present. Ainikoji teased her, but Kei knew he didn't get it. Kei's like, since it's you, you've never received a gift, right? Uh, awkward. Kei did not look Ainikoji in the eyes, but presented him with a gift. It's a Christmas present. He should gratefully accept it. But she expects him to return the favor twice over. What a ripoff. Ainikoji asked if she bought this for him. Kei couldn't answer. The words were stuck in her throat. From the beginning, she was holding something in and finally had the courage to speak out. She asked if it was okay for her to break up with Hirata, worried that if she did, she'd lose her usefulness. Ainikoji asked, is that why she didn't give him the gift? Originally, it was meant for Hirata. Kei nodded. Ainikoji knew Kei's terrified that he'd find Sato more useful than her. You can't twist it. Breaking up with Hirata will hurt Kei's influence. But to Ainikoji, even if she's less useful, she's still good enough. Ainikoji comforted her, saying it's okay if she wants to break up with him. Kei asked Ainikoji if he saw this coming. Yep, he did. Hell, he engineered it, having Kei switch her parasitic destination from Hirata to him. Ainikoji thought he did this by waiting until the last second to save Kei. Everything went according to Ainikoji. 
and Koji's calculation, except for the double date part, which worked out in his favor, deepening his bond with K. K reveals she already talked to Hirata about breaking up. The fake couple act put too much pressure on her. Ainakuji straight up thought the reason K just gave him was a lie. He believes the reason K broke up with Hirata is because of her strong parasitic reliance on him. But he also goes on to say K is making a mistake. The right play would be to keep her fake relationship with Hirata while still keeping her partnership with Ainakoji. That way she'll have a backup. That's the ideal strategy. But if K found it exhausting, then it can't be helped. Ainakoji wondered if Hirata would date someone else. K had no clue. From the beginning, she didn't really know much about Hirata. Ainakoji realized K went back to calling Hirata by his last name, but still used his first name, Kiyotaka. Ainakoji asked why. K's like, what, do you want me to stop? Ainakoji didn't mind it. In fact, he returned the favor by calling K by her first name. And the second he said her name, the word echoed through her mind. The word K kept repeating over and over. The skies parted and Cupid let loose a single arrow, which found its home within K's heart. Love struck K frantically asked why he's using her first name. He's like, well, if you use mine, I'll use yours. It's natural. They talked about the double date and Ainakuji revealed he knew from the beginning. Also, he did have something for K, a present. K's like, really? Ainakuji's like, nope, I lied. K was ready to fight him. Well, it was half of a lie. The gift is now useless. Ainakuji handed K a pharmacy bag. She was not impressed. The contents were even less impressive. Cold medicine and a receipt. Ainakuji told K to throw away the receipt, but K instinctively took a look. It was dated the 23rd, the day after the rooftop incident. Ainakoji confessed when he went to buy medicine, he noticed K and Sato. That's how he knew about the double date. He also noticed K wasn't sick. K just then realized that's the reason Ainakoji didn't check up on her. She stuttered saying, why not visit her? Call her. Do anything but this. Ainakoji explained that in a packed dorm, he can't just visit her. And if he called, he knew she'd put up a front. K did her best to keep it together, but inside she was falling apart. She knew about none of this. K felt like an idiot for thinking he wasn't worried. Ainakoji wasn't being cold. He didn't forget. She tried to hide her face because it was becoming so red. Inside her mind, a mini K was just running around and squealing, jumping for joy. She could not deny it anymore. Ainakoji stole away her heart. She wondered if this was okay, falling for someone who partly bullied her, but she could no longer ignore it. She had seriously fallen in love. Ainakoji apologized for the rooftop incident. He admits what he did was inhumane. He can't complain if she holds it against him. That's why he didn't contact her without reason. But it was a mistake. He misjudged the strength of her heart. By the way, this also refers to K not giving up his name to ruin. Ainakuji admits that was beyond his expectation. K's like, yup, don't underestimate me. Ainakuji asked again. Moving forward, will she lend him her strength? K's like, sure, as long as he protects her. Ainakoji promised. It's been eight months since Ainakoji arrived. So many things have happened, but the most significant is K. Before he knew it, she became an irreplaceable existence. And if they move forward, maybe one day they can be friends. Or maybe even more. This is the best line in this entire volume. And dare I say it, one of the best lines in the entire series. To understand why, we have to understand the reason K fell for Ainakoji. At the beginning of this volume, K mentions Ainakoji saving her. In fact, she mentions it over and over again. He's strong to the point it's unbelievable. There are also ruthless and cruel parts to him. But even so, in the end, he'll save me. At first, I despaired. Even anger came out. But in the end, I was saved. She mentions being saved when she realizes she has feelings for him. She mentions it when she can't get him out of her head. And when I first noticed, obviously I thought of Ainakoji beating Ruin. That's the saving she's referring to, right? Even Ainakoji thinks that he tells us in this volume. The incident on the rooftop was certainly a massive turning point for K. The trust K had in me soared. But the more I read, the more I realize K fell for him long before that moment. And what K means by being saved is completely different than what I imagined. Let's break it down. Here's what Kay says as she decides to no longer be a parasite in volume 7. Although I didn't understand a lot of what he did, it was still somehow strangely fun. Besides, no matter how it happened, it's still a fact that I was saved. That's why I regret nothing. She said this before Ainakoji saved her from ruin. And it tells us exactly what she means by being saved and why she fell for Ainakoji. We know Kay had her self-worth shattered from bullying and was forced to put on an act to protect her 
herself. Emphasis on force. She did it because she had to. She didn't enjoy it. She verbalizes that in this volume. Recently, I had grown tired of the me who had been acting bullishly and arrogantly. For a moment, I wanted to talk about something true. And Ainakoji noticed Kei hated the act as early as volume 4.5. Kei never struck me as the sort of person who'd resort to violence or intimidation in the first place. She could pretend all she liked, but she was just playing that part to protect herself. Think about it. All this time Kei's putting on an act, miserable, wishing she can be her true self. And then Ainakoji comes along causing the whole Manabe fiasco. Ainakoji reveals Kei's scar, which is massive. There's a reason Kei thinks about that at the start of this volume. Seeing that scar meant Ainakoji had seen her darkest secret. He didn't mock her. He didn't say nasty things about her scar. He accepted her secret. And from that point on, Kei no longer had to act around him. He was the first person around whom she could be her true self. You saw this as early as volume 4.5. It's just that I don't really like bringing up my past. I thought I'd never tell anyone about it, but I ended up telling you and it felt so surprisingly fine. It's kind of odd, you know? From there on, Ainakoji continued to build her self-worth by including her in his schemes. And if you remember, the self-worth K built by helping Ainakoji is what gave her the strength to defy ruin and discard her parasitic persona. That's why K said no matter what happens, she doesn't care about the terrible things Ainakoji did to her because it ultimately led to her freedom. And you guys know I do my research. I found a lot about Kay having Stockholm Syndrome and I just don't see it. Stockholm Syndrome is when victims fall for their abuser. When they're being abused. Kay did not fall for Ainakoji in volume 4 when he abused her. At that point, she didn't like him at all. Her feelings were only negative. Their relationship got a little bit better at volume 4.5. Kay admits in her monologues that she doesn't need youth. And nothing interesting happened in her life before Ainakoji showed up. In volume 4.5, Ainakoji gave Kay a taste of what she was missing made her feel things she hasn't felt. You can clearly see it's the first time Kay felt happiness since she arrived at the school. And from volume 5 onward, their relationship started to grow. They worked together. Kay got jealous of girls around Ainakoji. When she fell for him, there was no abuse. Kay fell for Ainakoji because he gave her confidence, freeing her from the prison of her past and created a foundation where she can start to be her true self. That's what she means when she says he saved her. That's why she loves him. And I bet money that this is the reason why Kei was so salty to see Sato fall for Ainakoji for such a shallow reason. It was a knee-jerk reaction because she knows the reasons she fell for Ainakoji run deep and Kei's feelings are also why she's afraid of Sato replacing her. Remember Kei mentions she has no idea what Ainakoji is thinking if he's even into romance. So in Kei's mind she can't be in Ainakoji's life if she's not involved in his schemes. And Kei is justified because Ainakoji isn't even aware he freed her from being a parasite. Do you remember in volume 7 where Kei chose to not give up Ainakoji's name? We got a split point of view. From Kei's point of view, she didn't give up his name because of her growth. But Ainakoji thought it was because of her strong parasitic reliance on him. Well, the author pulled the same trick in this volume. But this time, it's about Kei's decision to break up with Hirata. If you piece together the clues, you'll know why Kei wants to end it. First, she lets us know she wants to experience real love and realizes as long as she's in a fake relationship, that can't happen. And lastly, as long as she's with Hirata, Ainakoji won't pursue her. He won't see her as a girl. Put this all together, Kei wants to break up with Hirata so she can pursue her true love, which is Ainakoji. Kei giving up her fake relationship with Hirata is the ultimate symbol of her growth because so far her parasitic persona was defined by that relationship. It gave her power, influence, everything she needs to be safe, but she no longer needs it. So she's okay with giving it up. By the way, this is undeniable proof that Kei's sticking around Ainakoji not because she's she just needs his protection, but because of her feelings. If she was relying on him just for protection, then why give up Hirata? She could have kept both Hirata and Ainakoji. Even Ainakoji said that's the right play. And why did Ainakoji point this out? Because his account of why Kei wants to keep their bond is different. He thinks she's breaking up with Hirata because of her strong parasitic reliance on him. Here, these are his words exactly. I had already assumed that Kei would want to break up with Hirata, or more like, I had induced her into wanting it, simultaneously both prompting her to act autonomously 
even after losing Hirata, as well as making her switch her parasitic destination over to me was my goal. Again, the author shows us a split point of view, but instead of showing it for Kay's growth, which is last volume, it's for the payoff to Kay's growth, which is this volume, which again is symbolized by her breaking up with Hirata. And it makes sense why Ainakoji is misunderstanding. Ainakoji does not entertain the fact that Kay loves him, because he firmly believes Kay did not forgive him for his actions. He expresses that again in this volume. I was huge hugely involved in that incident on the rooftop. I did something inhuman to the point where I cannot complain if you were to beat me up. While we have proof that K forgave him here, it's only because it happened to be a deeply generous person like me that he was forgiven. Ainakuji can't understand K forgiving him. And this is where that earlier scene with Ruin comes in clutch. Remember how we established when Ainakuji doesn't understand something? He creates reasons, rationalizations for why things are the way they are. He's doing it right here. Again, in his mind K can't love him. So the only way K's actions make sense is if she's still a parasite. You just saw a clear example. He thinks she's breaking up with Hirata because she's a parasite. And the reasoning he chose of her being a parasite isn't a coincidence. He chose that reason because he wants it to be the reason. Deep down he wants K to be a parasite because if there's no romance here, what's keeping them together? Nothing other than the relationship of use. Ainakoji believes the more he uses K, the more their personas will feed off each other. That's why he invites Kei to meet Kiriyama. That's why he calls her his partner, to get her deeply involved in his schemes. He wants to deepen their bond. And this is the only way he knows how. And Ainakuji's rationalizations don't just extend to Kei's actions. They even extend to his own actions. Ainakuji tells us time and time again he'd like to experience love. But he has no idea what love is. And the White Room warped his idea of love. He admits it in his monologue. It's just that in my heart, there was no such thing as an awakening of love in the first place. Boys and girls, I do understand the biological differences between them, but everything beyond that is pitch black for me. In the white room, that was a matter of common sense. He admits he can't imagine a normal life, a normal romance, enjoying the date honestly and going out with Sato. That should have been an obvious future too, but I cannot draw such a future on a canvas. He acknowledges the white room persona and feels he can never get rid of it, no matter what happens to someone else. As long as in the end you win, that's fine. This type of fundamental mindset is something I won't be able to throw away until the day I die. This really puts volume 4 into perspective. When Ainakuji stared into the darkness within K, he didn't feel connected to her just because both of them are abused. It goes deeper. He felt connected because they were both stuck in a prison of their own trauma. K was stuck having to take on the parasitic persona while Ainakuji had to deal with the white room persona. And yet it's another reason why Ainakuji wants K to be a parasite. Because you saw it, he believes he can't get rid of his persona. He's stuck with it. So if K gets her of hers, they can no longer feed off each other. They can no longer deepen their bond. Their relationship will crumble. That's why Ainakoji gives himself reasons, justifications to keep K close. The biggest example is that whole monologue we got where he compares K and Sato. He compares their usefulness and chooses to reject Sato in favor of K because K is quote unquote more useful. This was the moment I realized Ainakoji's coping hard because his justifications are wild. He says Arisu is a problem, Sai is a problem, the chairman can be a problem? Like how? We know Arisu is preoccupied with Ichinose. Ainakoji should know too because he set up the damn thing. Sai won't come after him. It'll be like shooting herself in her foot. And the chairman? You mean the guy that stood up to Ainakoji's dad for him. That guy's a problem? No freaking way. But Ainakoji uses these quote unquote threats as justification to need to protect himself, which conveniently gives him a reason to choose K over Sato. Funny how that works, huh? Again, he has no idea what he's feeling, but he wants to keep K close. And this is the only way it makes sense. And that's why that last line is so beautiful, where he hopes they can be more than friends. At the beginning of the volume, he wonders if he'll ever find it. An irreplaceable existence. To think of someone as precious to you, just by spending time with each other, to share happiness with one another, they become an irreplaceable existence to you. Those sorts of feelings and events, I wonder if I'll be able to experience them too. And at the end, we finally get a glimpse into how Ainakoji feels. Free from all the BS, free from all the justification, over the past eight months, K to him became an irreplaceable existence. What he hoped one day he could experience before I realized it. She had sublimed into an essential existence for me. Ainakoji doesn't know what he's feeling, but he knows this person K to him is special. He doesn't know what the relationship will become, but he hopes it's beyond being just friends. This has got to be the most entertaining scene 
series of misunderstandings ever. K is in love with Aina Koji. Aina Koji is in love with K but doesn't know it. Neither of them know about each other's feelings. Both of them want to be close to each other. Their relationship on the surface has not changed. But deep inside, it's not the same. Gotta say, one of the best written romances I've had the pleasure of reading. And it wraps up this arc beautifully. Last volume, you got to see the theme of change. And in this volume, you got to see the payoff to that change. And I love how the author is finally showing us the damage the White Room did to Aina Koji. We've had tons of foreshadowing. I covered some ways the White Room negatively affected him in the last volume. But this volume went all out. And my god, the thousand IQ play the author pulled here is incredible. Listen, the hell Aina Koji went through is no laughing matter. A good 14 to 15 years within the White Room. Ever since he was born, childhood trauma can mess you up. The scars can last for years. But how do you show that in the story. The author can say, oh, he has trauma, but that doesn't do anything. So here's why the author is big brain. He highlighted how bad Ainekoji's trauma is by comparing him to K. After rereading a few times, this just screamed out at me. Here's a few ways how. K realizes her feelings for Ainekoji, and she's able to come to terms with those feelings and accept them, while Ainekoji has similar feelings, but can't understand them. That's why he has to come up with justifications for his actions. Another one, K is able to overcome her persona and grow. And we see the payoff to that in this volume. While Aine Koji admits he'll never overcome his trauma. I am in no way downplaying what happened to K, But by giving us points of views and monologues from two different characters. Who both have trauma. And see relationships quite similarly as I've pointed out throughout this entire volume. The author helps us understand how deep Aine Koji's dysfunction goes. Honestly, some of Aine Koji's monologues in this volume were heartbreaking. Especially his date with Sato. So so many times he's wondering why Sato would even be happy to be on the date. Like her affection towards him made no sense. Or the literal walls of text where he thinks the only reason K would want to be around him is cause she's still a parasite. Like there's no legitimate reason for K to like him. Even with Sakura, Ainekoji can't imagine she'd be in love with him for a real reason. It's only because she has no experience. All of this tells me that he feels so undeserving of love or affection that when he gets any he can't believe it or can't even understand it. And it shows whenever he does receive kindness. He admits it's precious to him. Like a drop of water in the Sahara Desert. Because he's been deprived of any affection for so long. Guys, I'm starting to see it. The defectiveness in Class D isn't about abilities. It's either about trauma or personality issues. Or maybe a little bit of both. Sudo and Yukimura have mommy problems. Sakura had that whole idol thing. Haruka has trouble with her family. Hirata obviously has demons. And Horikita has a brother complex the size of Jupiter. Size words in volume 2 make sense. In my personal opinion, Ainekoji is the most defective student in class D. Listen, I love me an underdog story. But when it comes to special exams, it's hard for me to cheer for Ainekoji. Because I always feel like he's gonna win. He's trained for stuff like that his entire life. It makes sense. But when it comes to relationships, when it comes to understanding his own feelings, when it comes to romance, this is an arena where I can cheer him on. When I'm reading, I see him struggle. I'm happy whenever he takes any step forward. It always feels like a big win. I want to see him overcome his past, overcome his trauma. He's made progress in this volume by showing us he wants to be more than friends with K. And I'm so excited to see how this plays out. But the story is not over yet. And coming up is probably one of the weirdest stories I've ever shared on this channel. It has to do with Aina Koji, K, and an eggplant. And no, I'm not talking about the emoji. But first, let's talk about the time Ruin got a call from Arisu. The bell just rang for New Year's and Arisu wants to meet Ruin in person. Ruin's like, if you really want a date that badly, then come to my room. Arisu ignored the comments saying she'd be waiting outside. They met up by the vending machines and Ruin made her wait on purpose. Arisu didn't care, barely showing a hint of emotion. However, she was with her goons. Arisu commented on Ruin's injuries. It's not like he could hide them. Arisu joked for somebody who loves violence, he sure got beat. Ruin shot back saying he doesn't want to hear it from a cripple like her. Arisu just chuckled. Ruin warned them he'd take them all on. Unlike Arisu, Ruin doesn't need his lackeys. Hashimoto cut in saying there's no reason to fight. While Arisu got down to the heart of the matter, she came here to confirm if Ruin stepped down. And yep, he confirmed it. However, something was up. It's almost 
as if Arisu knew, knew about Ainakoji. But how would she? No one saw what happened. Did Arisu have her eyes on him before the incident? Even before he came to the school? Ruin wasn't 100% sure, but it's a possibility. Ruin asked Arisu if she ever lost to anyone, would she hide it? Arisu didn't know because she can't imagine losing to anyone. And Arisu still didn't buy the story of Ruin stepping down. Ruin's like, fine, what else can it be? Arisu didn't know that's why she called him. It's much easier to find out the truth in person. Ruin was on he's taking a step back from everything. Hashimoto was caught off guard, going, wait a second, are you serious? Arisu reminded them that Ruin still has his contract with Katsuragi. He'll be well taken care of. Ruin agreed he's just gonna sit back and watch. Arisu warned him though things might not go that smoothly. The implication being she can crush him anytime. But for the moment, her target will be Class B. So Ainekoji's intel was right on the money. Ruin's like, whatever, he had enough, he's going back. But he did tell Arisu one last thing. She won't won't always be the winner. Arisu told him if he wants to teach her defeat, she's ready anytime. Nah, -uh. for the moment, Ruins had enough. All right, on to the weird story. I'm just gonna dive in. Our scene opens up on a deserted island. Both Kei and Ainakoji are in swimsuits. They're stranded, but Kei was not afraid because Ainakoji is with her. She asked him what's going on. Are they in Tasmania? Ainakoji's like, first off, Tasmania is not an island. They could see Mount Fuji, so they're still in Japan. A hawk flew over the vast ocean. Escape looked impossible. Kei asked Ainakoji if he could swim to safety. Ainakoji said he could, but he wouldn't because that meant abandoning Kei and he won't do that. The mere gesture plunged Kei more and more into love. Her body got hotter by the second. She asked why he cared about her so much. Because she's his precious partner. And with that, Ainakoji suddenly hugged her. They wore swimsuits so Kei could feel the irresistible skin-on-skin -skin contact. Kei tried to break free saying their relationship isn't like that. Then they just have to make it like that, Ainakoji responded. He moved closer and closer. Kei resisted at first but soon gave into the mood. His face was right next next to hers as she whispered his name. They lovingly looked into each other's eyes. But right then you just hear a loud growl. Kei's hungry. She apologized for ruining the mood. Aniko's like, don't worry about it. And he also had the remedy. He handed her an eggplant. Kei's like, why? But little did she know that eggplant was the key to everything. Reality starts to fade. Ainekoji congratulated Kei on her Hatsuyume. What does that mean? Well, it's a term to describe a dream you have on the night of New Year's. Hawks, Mount Fuji, eggplants are all signs of good luck. That's why Ainakoji congratulated her. Kei saw all three. Kei, realizing it's a dream, reached out to Ainakoji, but he was long gone. She saw him swimming away. Her first kiss gone along with him. And then Kei suddenly woke up, embarrassed out of her mind, wondering why dream her was so desperate for a kiss. In reality, she'd never be this clingy. Still, it's a dream. She's allowed her fantasies. She wondered if her Hatsuyume would turn into a Masayume, which means a dream that comes true. Either way, she's gonna keep this one to herself. Also, I double check with the original source and Wicked. There are a few translation errors that need to be addressed. Here's the first one. When Kei realizes her fake relationship with Hirata will keep her from finding true love. She says this line in the official translation. Even Kyotaka wasn't attracted to me. Which like makes no sense. So we compared it to the Japanese raw and that reads, Kyotaka too will never see me as a member of the opposite gender. Or what she's trying to say is Ainekoji will never see her as a potential partner. Which makes a hell of a lot more sense. Another one, when Ainekoji and Ibuki were about to fight, Ainekoji says he loaned points to Kei, implying he gave points to Kei. But it's the opposite, he borrowed points from Kei. Remember, she was the VIP. If anyone had excess points, it would be her. When Ainekoji goes to meet Kiriyama, he brings Kei along. In the official translation, he says the reason is to hide himself. But in the Japanese version, he said the reason was to spice things up. And the final one, and in my opinion the biggest, is when Ainekoji said he failed to judge the strength of Kei's heart. You might be confused as to when he said that because it's not in the official translation at all. Again, huge shout out to Wicked for help on this video. We talked about a lot of ideas, which made the analysis as good as it is. So guys, leave a like, subscribe, and I'll catch you all on the next one.